Portrait Artist of the Year. This is an interview with Chris Longridge, who was a participant two times. This is so fascinating. Let's get started. And if you would, please consider leaving me a thumbs up and subscribe. I'm hoping to do more of these interviews. So here is Chris. All right, today I'm so lucky because Chris Longridge is joining me and I'm praying that I continue to call him Chris throughout this interview because I have a friend named Michael Longridge and I might mess up. So correct me if at any point I, I change your name. I wanted to talk about, you first came to my attention on Portrait Artist of the Year, the first time you were on, and you made it, I believe, to the semifinals of that episode. Or did you make it through? Yes, I made it through to the semifinals uh, of that series, and then I just did uh, 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 just the heat of the, the next series after that. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, the next time my my heart was broken. That I. <laughs> uh, so the first question is, how did you feel about your experience on the show? Well, I absolutely loved it. It was a, it was a very very positive experience. Although, um, if you watch all all the shows that I was on, you might not necessarily think so, uh, because after the first heat, everything was going brilliantly, and I made it through uh, to the semi-finals. Everything was going fine. Then the semi-final, I completely went to pieces. Um, fell apart under the pressure. Really, I think I couldn't couldn't quite get that one. I think for for when you're doing a portrait under time pressure, you need one particular little corner or something to be exactly right. And then from that, you build out. You, yep. you need one fixed point of reference. And I never found that. So I was just pushing paint around, pushing paint around, just flailing quite badly. Um, so, yeah, I, I failed at the semifinals. Um, and that was the end of the, my journey on that occasion. Uh, but the second time when I went back, um, uh, I didn't get through, but I was very happy with my painting. Um, Again, given the time constraints, uh, it went well. I love the people that I was there with, the artists that I were there with uh, were really great people. I'm still in touch with a lot of them. Um, and the people on the show treat you so well as the artists. You're really welcome there. I know a lot of TV shows and particularly um, competition type shows, the, the contestants can be treated a little bit like cattle sometimes. Oh. Not the case at all with Portrait Artist of the Year. They really treat you well, make you feel welcome, make you feel cared for. Um, and it was a very positive experience. Oh, I'm really glad to hear that. Um, the second time you went back, I'm I'm kind of going to go there. I'll probably edit it out, but I'm doing this for my own edification, which is the second time you painted a, a woman. I don't remember her name. A, a blonde. Uh, Casey Piper. Picture. Pardon me. Uh, the story was this for the semi-final or for the yeah. second heat that I did. The second heat. The second heat was Katie Piper. Oh, right, because I, I, Katie Piper picture painting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, she did, yes. I had a little fun with that. I just want to know, and I don't know if you can answer this, I'll probably edit it out, it's for me. How do you cope when you're at the end of a pro, when you know you're the best painter in the room? Because we all know to some, I know it's subjective, I know everybody's different. <sighs> There's no question in my mind you were the best painter in the room each time you it's were there. Funny. And I Thank wondered you. how you can walk away with a positive experience from that. Well, it's it's kind of you to say that you think I was the best painter in the room. Yeah, I, I'm, I I think that's a subject that's an opinion. Um yeah. I think the right person won on the day. Honestly, I know that sounds like false modesty, but uh, Alvin Kofi, who uh, won that particular heat, did a portrait of Don Letts that was more, um, it was braver than my portrait was of Katie. I thought I got perhaps a better likeness of Katie. Yes, you did. Uh, uh, but I don't, it's, it's the distinction between a good painting and a good portrait. I think I had quite a good portrait in that there was a good likeness. It was a decent bit of technical painting. I don't think it was an outstanding painting. Uh, I thought Alvin's painting was stronger. I understand what you mean in terms of design elements, perhaps. Would, um, that there was some pushing of the envelope on his part, as opposed to I think why we're usually commissioned for a portrait, which is that people generally want to have a likeness of themselves, kind of a much more standard uh, kind of painting. But, but of course, portrait artists here, you know, you're dealing with a different audience. 
So now, did the program affect your professional standing in any way? Well, yeah, I mean, it raised my profile enormously. I didn't really have a professional standing before I was on the show. Um, I was just a guy painting in his room. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, I mean, and then uh, uh, having been on the show, I got on to um, a, a much larger viewership really they lots of people started following me on instagram and uh, i set up the website so people could come and see stuff there people started commissioning me um uh, yeah i started making money really because of the show oh that's fantastic that 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 would be a very good reason for being on the program and and it it is grueling in terms of i i you know i work singly in my studio with absolutely no pressure at all and uh the idea of of the distractions would would just throw me so far off but it's not for everyone it's got to say i've got to admit it, it isn't for everyone yeah. to do you've got to be someone who's quite comfortable working fast and um isn't too uh isn't easily distracted by everything that's going on around you because it's like you say there's there's camera crew in your line of sight all the time you're far too far away from the sitter so you have yeah. to rely it's sort of yeah funny. well that that's true you know, and, and I think for all of us who, who kind of dedicate their lives to painting, I, I remember starting out um, with a mentor and I was just bereft at every painting that didn't work. And she just said to me, look, madam, if you're going to be doing this, you, a painting's a painting and you get on to the next one. And yeah. I didn't, I, I was too inexperienced to understand what she was saying, uh, but now I, yeah. now I do. I spent, I spent a long time pursuing perfection in, uh, in paintings and, it took a while to realize that 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 it's the, the the pursuit of it is absolutely fine but you have to stop eventually because you'll make it worse for one thing there's a point uh, there's a tipping point where you're heading towards perfection perfection is un unachievable and then you start heading down further away from it and you will never get back up i mean you might just tilt it back up a bit but you've already passed your point and when you realize you're past that point that's when you stop and and the pursuit of perfection is great because that's what makes you want to do the next one because oh. the next one will be better You're but it, of course so right. it's never perfect but the next one will always be better oh you are so in my head because every time i come into the studio i think oh i don't know about today or i don't think this is going to work I said, but maybe today maybe today yeah. will be the day which i've been saying for 20 years i think you're thinking well but the work does get better that's what i care about well, so, yeah, and also I think, I think yeah. you need to be able to you need to be able to um, accept your successes as well. And another thing that artists are very bad at doing is saying when people say, "Oh, that's a really good bit of work you did," oh, well, oh no, it isn't. It's terrible here, and oh, I made it, and you can't see the mistakes and all of you know. Take the compliments when they are sincerely made because they are true, <laughs> and just because you can see mistakes that other people can't there's there's great things about it that you can't see that they can and so you need to be able to accept that look, I, i'm having a bad day at the studio today but i've done good work in the past yeah i know i've done good work and i'm sure that it was good so i can do that again and that's another thing that gets you through those bad days when nothing else is nothing's really working for you but when people show up on that day it, it really doesn't matter to some degree what they paint on that day. Your art is judged by your portfolio of what you did in 2006, prior, prior to that as well. I mean, it's your whole body of work is what makes somebody the artist that they are, whether they're successful in their career or, or you know, monetarily or not. So it's just the tiniest snapshot of what someone can do on that day. And in that case, you know, that's that's fair, but it leaves me wanting and, and wanting to know more about about people like you. So, oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, the show is it's it's easy to kind of set too much store in it. It's it is it's a, it's a light entertainment. It's a bit of fun for artists who are I mean, and it is for artists who are able to paint quickly. There are so many incredibly talented artists, far more talented than me who would struggle on that show. I mean, I struggled on that show. They would struggle too on that show because you've got to be able to do it in four hours. Or, I mean, yeah, you get two half hour breaks and a one hour lunch break, which you're allowed to work through if you want to. So you actually get six hours if, you, if you're willing to go without meals, <laughs> as I was, because I, I wanted every moment I could possibly have, yeah. you know, just, just to, to make it perfect. Yeah. Um, 
and again because i'm i'm able to to, to focus for that long just because i am able to not everyone can i suppose but uh um i've sorry i've lost my original train of thought what i was going to say there well i was saying about the judging and that it, oh, yeah. So you can set too much for it in the in the set because it is it's just it's a four hour sketch that's all you're doing or a yeah. six hour sketch you know if you add in your, your breaks um that that doesn't say anything really about an artist except a very brief glimpse at their technique um so if, if you were an artist going on that show you shouldn't you know shouldn't put too much pressure on yourself because really what chance do you have to really show what you you what what you've got yeah that you've got it's just the tiniest little window and if you're a viewer of that show eh, don't judge the artist too harshly and i'm sure most viewers don't they most viewers are watching it thinking god i couldn't do that it looks far too much pressure as indeed i was before i applied and went on always you can always tell when they bring out they always have three celebrities and and each celebrity has three artists yeah the one section they call them cheeses on the show because they, they, they they're in in triangular wedges like slices oh, of a cheese oh, jesus cheese that's going to do best is the one that has the like the the 65 year old yes. ma male actor uh yeah. who's kind of like he's not uh classically handsome anymore at least perhaps he's uh, uh you know handsome for for yeah. his age or, or what i don't know what i'm saying there. but he's like you know he's got a big nose he's got he's got a characterful face it's right something you can work with they're going to be fine and the ones who are dealing with the you know the 19 year old actor yeah. uh, who's just like in her first uh, TV sh hit show. It's like, nah, forget it. Can't do her. <laughs> exactly. exactly. There's, there's just no. You, you can't find uh, all those kinds of shapes and values that you want to find in in a face that has a, a more character. Yeah, it's just. And, in, and the other thing, actually, sorry, talking about the uh, the fact that you've only got four hours to do a good portrait, you really need to ideally have a sense of their body in space. But you can't yeah. do yeah. a body. You can only do head and shoulders in the time that you've got unless you're willing to sacrifice the face and the judges are yeah. not fooled they make allowance for that they don't necessarily acknowledge it on show but of course they make allowance if you've they tried do. to if you've been ambitious they let you off having the likeness uh, a little bit yeah i but, feel like they judge you on what you do not what you didn't do when it comes to yeah. say a whole figure but you haven't finished so I think yeah it's how you accomplished what you intended yeah exactly oh you say it so much better than me <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I wanted to talk about the evolution of your work as well, because I don't know when you started doing sort of these more fractured portraits. I saw back in 2006, some, um, they're like pieces of glass on a, on a grid. And I thought, mm. wow, that was back in 2006. So he was already thinking in term, terms of like a fractured way of seeing things. But I wonder if you could talk about the evolution of that, because I think we're all we all want to get to a place where we paint well. But then there's a sea of people that paint well, you know, then it becomes a little bit more like, well, what are you going to do with that now? And so, yeah, what you to this sort of imagery that's a little bit more um, personal, I guess, in a way. Yeah, well, that glass painting that um the, those glass paintings, I should say, there were a, a, a series of them. They were kind of the first paintings that I did where I, I like your distinction there. You, everyone wants to be able to paint well. And then it's like, well, what do I what do I use my painting well with? And I still don't think I'm painting as well as I could do. There's always room for improvement technically. But technical, the technical side of things is by far from the most important. Yes. You know, it's it's only a part of, uh, of the journey. Um, and yeah, those glass paintings were the first time that I was using, I was able to, to to put what I could do to a purpose rather than simply improving my skill. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting that you draw a parallel between those paintings from, uh, like say, 2004, five, six, yeah. and the, the kind of more fractured portraiture and uh, responses to paintings that I've been doing painted painted responses to paintings which are again broken up and 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 sort of reconfigured I hadn't actually put that together in my mind but actually yes they are there is very much a line between the two um where I, I have to address you have to any any painter today has to address photography firstly why are you painting something rather than just having a photograph of it yeah. what is it that adds what can you do in paint that you can't do in photography um so the the kind of the 
the first response that the the, the artists had to that was impressionism, uh, which was a different way of looking, um, and then it was cubism, breaking up the the two dimensional space. Um, so that fracturing is is a little bit of of the same kind of instinct that the cubists had. Um, there's also a kind of there's a kind of a, a cognitive aspect if that's the right word for it it's about differing not just a different angle of view on the same object it's about differing perspectives through history you know over time space from one person to another so it's not just different views of the same thing it's different perspectives on the same thing now in the glass paintings i was that's quite literal because you mm. use broken glass as, mm -hmm. and then coming behind it, you're able to then fracture the thing that's behind the glass without it actually being fractured. It's just a fractured perspective. Um, with the paintings of paintings that I do, uh, I've used Photoshop initially to reconfigure oh, a photograph yeah. of a painting. Let's yeah. say it's a photograph of, uh, of the, the one behind me here um, is uh, Rubin's... Uh, elevation of the cross um and i isolated elements of it put it through photoshop moved it around twisted it up moved bits forward backwards changed the colors a little bit here and there and then when i was satisfied with how that looked i then painted that so it's a painting of a photoshop reconfiguration of a photo of a painting if that's enough postmodernist layers for you um and that's where <laughs> my multiple perspectives yes come in so it's about it's a it's about multiple perspective that's one of the things that the paintings are about yes i definitely got that message the other message that it gives there's a certain drama to them because of how dark the backgrounds are in contrast to the subject and also a tremendous amount of movement and you know one thing about photorealism in general is um uh, I'm not a fan of photorealism you know i i mean i am when people do it i'm like that's fantastic that's just but they're they're very very static and something that um kind of like what you're describing here is using it kind of brings the old masters to life i guess is what i'm trying to say as opposed to you know we've all seen certain paintings like um ruben um rembrandt self-portrait right or the mona lisa and once you've seen something 500 times in your lifetime you kind of can't see it anymore and this is yeah. a way of being able to see things with, and so it makes me want to look at those paintings and then go back and appreciate where it came from as well. And it's a way to make old masters relevant for us today too. I, I really enjoy the, you know, the bravery of the interpretation of that because some of these are sacred <laughs> things <laughs> to some people. Yes, yeah. I mean, they are, yes. Um, do you mean sacred in terms of as Christian objects or as... What do you think of the future of painting? And what do you think you'll do in the future with your painting? Well, um, I never used to sell any paintings when I started. So I've always had a day job, full-time job. I'm a, I'm a journalist in, in real life. Uh, so okay. thankfully, I don't have to rely on what will sell, won't sell. Um, so I don't look at trends in the market or anything like that. Yeah. All I've ever, I mean, I don't think most artists really do. You, you paint what you have to paint because that's what's trying to get out of you. That's what you want to get onto the canvas. You do it because you want to do it. So I'll keep painting no matter what. And the, 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 the thing that, that motivates me isn't necessarily sales, although they are always very welcome. Yeah. It's, it's the pursuit of an excellence by my own standards. Yes. Um, it's the perfection that we were talking about earlier that you never achieve. It's it's having an outlet in my life where the only thing that matters is being as good as I possibly can at something. And now in most spheres of life, you just don't have the control to do that, you know, unless you're an elite athlete or something like that, um, or you've got an extremely supportive network of people around you. But art is quite small. It's just a canvas and you're pushing colored paste around it. That's something that you control enough that you can pursue the excellence of your own definition uh, to its ultimate conclusion, if you like. And so that's that's what I have always wanted to do in paint. And that's what I do do. Now, as for the future of painting, 
it's a very vexed question because as I've, I've mentioned before firstly there's photography was a big challenge why are you painting when there's a photograph can do certain things yeah much better than a painting can. Well, it turns out there are certain things a painting can do that phot photography can't do. Yeah. And then the next challenge was, well, now there's Photoshop and you can manipulate your photos in, in a way that a painter could manipulate paint. In fact, better than a, a painter can yeah. manipulate paint in mm -hmm. many cases. So what are you going to do with that? And then, well, you find ways to do, kind of justify to yourself, well, why am I doing this rather than just using Photoshop? And now the challenge is AI image generation. Yeah. Where you can just put in a prompt and it will paint the image for you. Mm. For a lot of artists, that's a really existential problem. It's, you know, how do you, how can I compete with that? And I would say the answer is, I mean, I don't know what it's going to do to the marketplace in terms of money, but money isn't really what's been motivating me as an artist anyway. So that doesn't bother me quite so much. Um, the point is that, an AI image is dirt cheap. There are billions out there already, and you can make billions of them yourself. So images cost nothing, but art takes effort yes. and passion and care. So every brushstroke on a painting has been chosen. But if it's a good painting, you, you as an artist have selected everything that's gone into there. Yes made decisions as to why each brushstroke is why it should be why the image is it should be what its relationship is to its dimensions to the the frame mm -hmm. everything there's a there's so much care and passion has gone into that yeah. and that what people respond to as wow. much as it is the image now you are creating an image just like an ai is creating an image but their images are dirt cheap your image has value because of what you care about because of the care that's in it there's no care in an ai image because it's just thrown out and well, i think yeah. people who people who want art want it for the reasons that you like making it so there will always be a market yeah, yeah. people who previously just wanted images well they'll get their free images from ai and they'll stick them in a clip frame and they'll put them on the walls and they won't care about them because it didn't mean anything to them the ones that mean something are the ones that mean something to the artist. Oh, gosh. That's so true. It's it's so true. Um, I hope so. <laughs> well, um, I don't know if it's because I'm very, uh, you know, I tend to be really visual. I'll probably cut this out too, but, um, and then I'll, 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 we'll finish up. Um, when I'm watching um, movies, films, in other words, as soon as the CGI screen comes on, I'm, oh, damn, you know? Yeah. Oh, oh, I can't, I've suspect I'm out of the story because I can tell the flatness of that. And it's kind of what you just described. There is yeah, there's a lot of discourse about it. In, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an entertainment journalist. I, I work in film and TV. Oh, my and gosh. I haven't really been able to articulate it exactly yeah. right. But what you're saying is the problem. What they always say is like, oh, I don't like CGI. It's kind of weightless. It's always a bit, you know, it's like perfectly smooth, but it's like you don't care about it when the stunts are happening. Yeah. And that's why don't because that you know that it's not real yes it's who cares about it then because it doesn't matter yeah so it's great to have cgi in movies if you're you know if you're taking the wires out of the stunt that's fine if you're adding taking tele oh, telephone yeah. poles out of the yeah. uh, out of the fields or out of the desert that's great because you need to clean up the image in some way yeah. you know you need to color grade it a little bit that's all fine but there, there's a point again where it's, there's too much and what you're doing is replacing the actual passion of image making with, you know, I don't know, ready-made stuff. Yes, it's 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 very strange to me. <laughs> um, and I, I hope at some point that that either they get better at it or it goes away. But um, <laughs> but one thing we know about the human eyeball, you know, that is different than the camera is the eye can still see differently than even the best camera it just it just does and that's what makes us human so well we've got two of them and the camera's just got one well true which makes a huge difference right there right so is there anything else you want to share that that um about 
either your experience or your life now. Um, and, and I'll put in the, of course, in the meeting notes, how to, how people can find you and follow you. And um, I think we covered all the, the kind of areas that are generally my hobby horses, <laughs> the things that I like to talk about in art. So I uh, know, I think we're fine there. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, you know, from the minute you came on the screen, I thought this guy's got it. No, oh, thank oh, you. I, there have been some others, and many people do, but um, yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, uh, your kind of painting speaks to what I try to do in my kind of painting, which is all those fantastic, you know, lost and found edges, minimal strokes, all the information you need, but not too much information, careful editing and decision making of every single stroke. And it just, you know, I watched as you worked and I thought, oh, I get this guy. I guess. <laughs> well, that's very, all extremely flattering. I, I, I'm sure that certainly on the shows, not every single brushstroke was carefully considered. There was a lot of mess and a lot of, um, you know, shoveling things around, trying to make them work that didn't I, work. I can just imagine it would be like, uh, you know, being thrown in someone else's kitchen and being told, you know, go ahead and bake a pie. I'm like, Okay. Yeah. Do you know what the, hard, the hardest thing was actually the the first heat was the easiest by far because Noel Clark, my sitter, uh, um, he sat still and I, I I found it very easy to block him in and I had my my reference points were working very early on. My only thing that I changed really was that the background that they gave me was the wrong tone, so I changed that and it worked really well. It worked the really well, that like that purple color yes. worked really well. This flesh tone. Yeah. Um, so that me. But then the next two sitters I had, so in the semi final, I had Elaine Page and then Katie Piper and said, both very fair skinned, both blonde hair. Yeah. And as you know, when you paint people, it's like blonde hair is the hardest to paint, particularly in bright studio lights. They gave me terrible background um, for Katie, yeah. at least. The, the Elaine one was a bit better. But for, for Elaine, they wanted us to incorporate the background as part of the oh, narrative. They do. Oh. And, you know, you've only got four hours. Yeah. You just, yeah, all the other artists basically ignored it. And Muggins here, yeah. <laughs> he tried to, I tried to get like the brickwork and the lights. And, oh, it was a catastrophe. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's for So thank you so much. And um, I will be putting your images as well in this interview. And of course, all the contact information. And, you know, big fan on this side of the pond. And I'll be, I'll be following and watching. So thank you for your generosity. And um, thank you very much for asking me to do it. I'm enormously flattered. Oh, thanks. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.